on Thursday, the 18th of January 1973, um, my sister-in-law came to work and uh, said that I should go home with them immediately, that something had happened to Francie. I took it to be maybe an arrest or something. And when I did get home, my mummy and daddy were there to meet me. And they told me that they thought Francie had been shot dead. And they were in the process of going along to the Royal Victoria Hospital to identify him. Uh, when they came back, they confirmed that this was in fact what had happened. Francie was a member, an active member of E Company, 2nd Battalion. Ogley Nairn, and he was shot dead by a British soldier uh, while carrying out an armed raid at the bank in the Royal Victoria Hospital. There was a lot of controversy, and there still is in fact, over the large army presence in and around the Royal Victoria Hospital. Uh, my mother and father didn't want me to go along to Mrs. Liggett's, Francie's mother's, to inform her, but I insisted that I did want to go. Um, that was obviously very distressing for, for his mother to be informed. Uh, later on that day, I noticed that Francie had left his wedding ring and his other rings on the dressing table. So I can only assume that he had a good idea of the immense danger his life was being put at. I remember coming back from the new lodge and the district did seem even to me to be in turmoil. Everybody was visibly upset and shocked at Francie's death. Uh, there was a steady flow of neighbours coming to the house uh, with messages of sympathy. In fact, I could never thank the people enough around here for their support at that time. They were very, very good. Francie's remains came to the house on Friday night around tea time, and members of Mathena Aaron and the Common Amon uh, did Guard of Honour, a conti continuous Guard of Honour from the Friday night until his remains left for the chapel on Sunday night. When the remains <coughs> were leaving the house on uh, the Sunday night, I remember going out and it was as if the whole district had turned out because it was just a sea of faces. And I remember hearing the volley of shots been fired over the coffin. Uh, the tricolour draped coffin was met at St John's Chapel by Father Harper and was escorted again by the Guard of Honour to the front of the chapel. Father Harper remarked during his ceremony, our sermon, that uh, it was ironic that he had married us in St John's Chapel just six weeks previous. After one o'clock mass on Monday, Francie's remains were taken to Milltown Cemetery and hundreds of people turned out at the funeral, as was reported in the Irish News the following morning. Francie's buried in the Republican plot at Milltown Cemetery. Well, Wednesday 3rd of October 79, I am round to Mommy's by 25 past six. And there was Mommy and Sadie there. And Sadie and you were sitting there on, the seat, on her own chair. And as soon as I was in the door, she says, I'll get up and make a cup of tea, Kate. I says, fair enough. And she went out and she put the kettle on for tea. And I was sitting there beside my mommy. And she came in, she sat down on the end of the chair. And there's a rap at the door. Well, I went to get up out of the tea to answer the door. And she says, all right, I'll get it. And she went to answer the door, and it was only a tiny rap on the door, the way you just drop a glass door. And now uh, she got up to answer the door, and soon she opened the door. There was a bang. 
Now at that time we didn't know it was a gunshot until she staggered into the house holding her right side. And when she staggered in, the gunman came in after her. And he fired again and he hit her here in the right arm. Was he masked? He was masked. He had a, a crash helmet and one of these balaclava things over his head. <coughs> underneath it like. But as soon as he fell to the floor then, he, my mummy squealed and he turned and he fired where I was sitting. I was, as soon as he fired, I pushed my mummy down and I went on top of her under the tea and the bullet just went where I was sitting. I said he tried to die and shot, help me, Cassie, I'm shot. And I tried to help, put my hand down to her. And as I tried to put my hand down, he put his gun in my back. But the gun jammed. And he ran out. And then my mommy ran out squealing. And people started to come in then, they must have heard the shooting then, but people started to come in and I kept yelling for somebody to get help, I said it. And somebody, I don't know who it was or what it was, who they were or what they were, but somebody went and they must have rang the ambulance. But the ambulance come and said he couldn't move. They wouldn't let nobody move her from the way she was on the floor. But when the ambulance took her away, I went with her and another neighbour. And there was a fella went with us. And now, uh, we took her to the hospital. And she didn't last very long. She was dead before seven o'clock that night. Well, my mummy, as you know, died of a broken heart. When she after said he was dead and all, my mummy took Parkinson's disease. She hadn't been well since he died. Well, there was a trial on the 12th of May, 81, and there was four up. But they hadn't got the two that done the actual shooting or the one that done the motorbike, drove the motorbike. And there was one got seven years, one got five years, and two got four years. Now the one that got seven years was a fellow called Irwin. He had met a conspiracy to murder, getting the gun, getting the motorbike, and being a member of the UVF, he got seven years. I can't mind the other fellow what he got five years for, but he, can, he was connected in all the UVF. He admitted everything. But there was two that got four years each, and one of them was Morrow from down Donegal Road. That name I'll never forget. He was the one that was kept in protective custody. He was arrested on the 13th of December, the same year they said he was killed, 79. And he was in protective custody from he was arrested until he was <coughs> up for trial. He got four years. Now he admitted driving the two gunmen, the two killers away to the place in the Lisburn Road and bringing their clothes back to the house in Glen Macken Street. Now he knows who the two killers are and he has been since released to his food in jail for he only got four years and they only do two out of four. The night before my son was murdered, I was up in his house. He asked me to babysit for him. They were playing a, a Card, card came between an awful lot of fellas and he says, will you sit for me more and not belong? We're, we're in for a competition here. So he was in for a competition. So he went on out, I sat with the baby children, put them to bed, made them a cup of tea. And he come back down about half eleven. And I sat talking for about ten minutes and I come on down home. And that was the last scene of Jim in my life. I went to bed and was waiting for the door getting put in where my family had come to tell me that my son had been murdered. I come up that the murderers come up the back way, cut the glass at his back door, cut it out. They didn't bang it in, they cut it out. And they must have had slippers on them because Jim would have heard the grass grow. That's why I can never understand how he didn't hear him. He must have had them slippers on him anyway, but they shot him dead. And when they found out at his inquest that he had 24 wounds in him, that's how many wounds he had in him at his inquest. And they brought the inquest up and they asked him, the solicitor asked him how they, they couldn't he see, see the car when it, the M1 and they hear the shooting. They couldn't hear nothing from the outlook. But still, if there was anything going on in Rodney, them animals up there can pick them out any, any, any distance. But they still couldn't see the murders and ice on that night. <laughs> um, I don't really know what to say. I just um, I think is. 
thank you all for your uh, tremendous support over the past lot of years for the men on the blankets and especially for the men over in hunger strike. They're um, your support was very, very welcome. It was necessary for the blanket protest that kept us going all the time, knowing that you were always behind us.